This is part three of our video introduction to the periodic table. In it, we will discuss some of the more advanced trends of the periodic table. But before we start, let's uh, quickly go over what we learned in video part two. So, the elements in group 18, also known as group 8A, are known as the noble gases. They are the most unreactive elements because they are extremely stable. Now, this stability is due to their uh, full valence shell. As such, other elements will lose or gain electrons in order to obtain a full valence shell, as this will provide them with stability. So, for instance, lithium. Lithium has two shells because it's in period two. So this is period one, period two. And since it's in period two, it has two shells and one valence electron. One valence electron because it's in group one over here. So group 1A, one valence electron, and period two, so two shells. And there we have it. Two shells and one outer valence electron. Now in order to achieve stability, lithium can either gain seven more electrons and have a full valence shell. All right, that's option one. Or it can lose this one electron and once that electron is gone the whole outer shell is gone as well and now it has a full outer valence shell. Remember the first shell can only hold two electrons. Obviously losing one electron is much easier than gaining seven electrons and so that is the path it will take. Now if you look at the periodic table you'll notice that lithium has th atomic number three meaning that it has, should have just three uh, protons and three electrons. But since we have uh, lost one electron, it only has two electrons now. And remember, electrons are negative, protons are positive. So the overall charge is actually one plus, right? Because there's three positives for every two negatives. So what's left over is one positive. And at this point, we call it an ion. So an ion is an atom that has gained or lost electrons and now has a positive or negative charge. And to show that it's an ion, we put square brackets around it to show that this was not the original structure, but that this is what happened to it. It had lost an electron to get a positive charge. Now, uh, more specifically, the ion is just a generic term. If we want to talk about positive ions, we have to call it a cat ion. So this would be a lithium cat ion. Now, how do I remember cat ion is positive? Well, if you take a look at the T, the T kind of makes a positive sign. All right, so cat ion means a positive ion. Positive ion. On the other hand, fluorine. Fluorine, again, is also in uh, period two, all right? so second row of the periodic table. So that means it should also have two shells. But it's in group 17, also known as group 7A. Thus, fluorine has two shells and seven valence electrons, seven outer shell electrons. So again, uh, fluorine, in order to become stable, needs a full valence shell. It can either gain one valence electron or it can lose the seven electrons that it originally had in order to have a full outer shell there. Oops, made a mistake right there. So let me erase that. There we go. Obviously, that's not the easiest way. The easiest way would be to simply gain the one valence electron, and then it has a full outer shell. So if you look back at the periodic table, Fluorine has an atomic number of 9, meaning that it should have 9 protons and 9 electrons. But again, since it's gained an electron in this case to become stable, you now have 10 negative electrons for every 9 positive protons, which means your overall charge for fluorine is negative 1. So again, it is now an ion. But more importantly, a negative ion. And a negative ion is called an anion. So this would be a fluorine anion. Again, put the square brackets on it to show that this was not the original structure, that something has changed to it, and it is the addition of a negative electron. And that's why it has a one negative sign, because now you're more negative in the end. So the next trend we'll be discussing is atomic radii. Uh, radii is the plural for radius. And so essentially, this is the size of an atom. So atomic radius increases as you go down a group on the periodic table. This is because as you go down the group, 
you increase the number of shells. So in the first uh, group, uh, well, in the first period rather, there's only one shell. In the second period, two shells. Third period, three shells and four shells. So each and every time you go down this period or this group, you are increasing the number of shells. Thus, atomic radius increases as you go from top to bottom. Now, atomic radius also increases as you go from right to left. The reason behind this is due to the decreasing number of protons as you go from right to left. So remember, protons are positive, electrons are negative. Positive and negative will attract each other. But as you have less and less and less protons in the center of the nucleus as you go from right to left, you have less attraction power towards the center. So that's like saying I have oxygen with eight protons and it's holding on to these electrons and so these electrons are being attracted towards the center, towards the nucleus. Right? And here's their orbit over here. Now, let's take a look at something with less protons, such as beryllium. And beryllium only has four protons. Because it only has four protons, these electrons over here, well, they're going to be way out here at this point, they're not really as attracted towards the center. Right? Because there's just not as much attraction power towards the center because of the only four protons. And because of that, they hang much looser and orbit a lot further away. Oops. Right? So the larger your nucleus or the more protons you have, the closer, the more attraction power there are for the electrons being brought to the center. And because of that, you have a decreased radius and you have a smaller atom. On the other hand, if you have only a very few protons, like beryllium, four protons, well, you can't attract the electrons as easily or as strongly towards the center. And so that's why they can exist or they orbit a little slightly further away. So just to recap, atomic radii is the size of an atom. It increases from top to bottom because you're adding shells. So first period, only one shell. Second period, you have two shells. Third period, you've got three shells, and so on and so forth. So obviously it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, in, uh, atomic radii increases from right to left because on the right-hand side, uh, well, this guy switched up. Oxygen is on the right-hand side. Beryllium is on the left-hand side. Uh, just to show you over here. All right, so oxygen's over here. Beryllium is actually over here. I should have drawn it the other way. My apologies. So oxygen is on this side. It is smaller because it has eight protons and attracts the electrons really strongly towards the center. So it pulls them in closer. Because it pulls them in closer, smaller radius. Beryllium, on the other hand, has a very small uh, nucleus, only four protons. Because of that, the attraction force towards the center is not that great, so electrons can orbit a little further away. And that's why it has a larger radius. All right, so. I, uh, atomic radii, or atomic radius, the size of the atom, increases as you go from top to bottom and from right to left due to the decreasing number of protons and less attraction force as you go from right to left, which makes them even bigger. Alright, so the overall trend for atomic radius is essentially in this direction. So the largest atom on the periodic table should be over here whereas the smallest atoms should be on this side over here. All right? So overall trend is from right to left and top to bottom. That is the atomic radii. The next trend on our list is ionization energy, also known as IE. Uh, ionization energy is the energy required to remove the outermost electron from an atom. And so the trend for ionization energy is to increase as you go from the bottom of the periodic table, the bottom of the group, to the top of a group. Think about it this way. If I'm holding a basketball close to my body, it's very hard to knock that ball, uh, the ball out of my hands. You need a lot of energy to uh, knock it out of my hands. Similarly, an electron that is close to the nucleus requires a lot of energy to knock it out. So that's the ionization energy. It requires a lot of energy to pull it away from the nucleus. Similarly, uh, 
an electron or rather a basketball that's being held away from the body, like far out here, it's much easier to knock that ball out of the person's hand. And just like on an atom, if you have a lot of shells, an electron that's really far away from the nucleus, it's going to be very easy to knock it out. So you don't need a lot of energy. And that's why you have low ionization energy. And so from the last trend, we found the largest atom is in this corner of the periodic table. right? And as you go to the top, you have smaller atoms with less shells. And so electrons in the small atom are held very close to the nucleus. So you need a lot of energy, a high ionization energy, to knock it out. On the other hand, over here, when you have the big atoms, all right, it's just like holding a basketball away from your body. Very easy to knock it out. Similarly, electrons that are way or far away from the nucleus can be easily knocked out, so you require less energy. And that's why ionization energy increases as you go from the top, or rather from the bottom, to the top of a group. And so ionization energy increases from bottom to top because more energy is required to remove an electron that is closer to the nucleus than it is uh, from one that is farther away from the nucleus. Ionization energy also increases from left to right on a periodic table. Just take a look at the elements in group 1a as compared to the elements in group 7a. Elements in group 1a all have one valence electron, and so it's much easier for them to lose that one electron for stability. And so if they want to lose electrons for stability, they don't need a lot of convincing, so you require very little energy to knock them off. On the other hand, in group 7a, these guys just need one more electron to become stable. Just one more electron to become stable. And so it takes a lot of convincing, a lot of energy, in order to knock off an electron, because they are trying to gain electrons instead. Furthermore, they're also, from the last trend we looked at, they're also smaller on this end than they are on this end, in terms of atomic radius. And remember what I said? The smaller the atom, the closer the electrons. The closer the electrons, the harder it is to rip the electrons away from the uh, atom, from the uh, nucleus rather, because it has a better hold on it. And so that's why ionic ionization energy increases as you go from left to right. So these guys over here require the most amount of energy to rip off electrons, whereas these guys over here require the least amount of energy to rip off electrons. So the overall trend for ionization energy is in this direction, right? where the largest atom requires the least amount of convincing, the least amount of energy to rip off the outermost electron, whereas the smallest atom over here requires the most convincing, the most amount of energy to rip off the outermost electron. So to recap, ionization energy increases from bottom to top because more energy is required to move an electron that is closer to the nucleus and the smallest atoms are at the top, whereas the biggest ones are at the bottom. Uh, ionization energy also increases as you go from left to right, because metals are larger and electrons are further, while nonmetals are smaller, so the electrons are closer, uh, which means they require more energy to remove. So electrons are further, uh, whereas they're closer for nonmetals, and then larger for metals.